Hi, JSCOM. I am so excited to be here. I gave a talk here last year in the B-Track on accessibility of web components. If you caught that talk, you may remember a secret thing that happened at the end, which resulted in real life tacos. To admit though, I actually, I gotta say, I like pizza more than tacos. Uh, if I could choose, I would always choose pizza every time. I really wanted to work pizza into this talk somehow, and at the risk of sounding cheesy, we are going to make this happen. So hold on a second. Hi, I'd like to order pizza. Yeah. Uh, let's do one cheese and one pepperoni. Yeah, you're going to bring it to Marcy Sutton, uh, JS Conf in track A. Yeah. You have 30 minutes. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. OK, so now we can get started. Got that thing. In the time it takes for this pizza to get here, I'm going to tell you about something I'm really passionate about, which is accessibility. We're going to talk about automated accessibility testing, which is a way that you can actually work accessibility into your workflow. I'm Marcy Sutton. I'm a developer in Seattle. I currently work at a company called Substantial, and I want to give them a shout out because I went to Substantial to learn about software testing and Git and pragmatic software practices. And now I'm up here giving a talk at JSConf. So I'm pretty stoked that I got to go work there and learn this stuff. In July, I'm actually moving over to Adobe where I'll be an accessibility engineer on anything web-based across the company. So I'm pretty stoked about that. I'm also an Angular core team member. I'm the primary contributor to NG Aria, which is the accessibility module. And since August, I've been working on material design for Angular, which is a component library. We'll talk about it a little bit, but the focus today is obviously automated accessibility testing. My slides are on GitHub. They're also, there's a shortcut from my website, uh, marcysutton.com slash jsconf2015. So accessibility, it's the answer to a more inclusive web. It's the way that we can build websites and mobile apps and experiences that work for more people. Because a fifth of the population on the planet has some kind of disability. Uh, so if we, don't, if we keep not addressing accessibility, we're leaving out a ton of people. Pizza is also always the answer, just saying. I'm going to gloss over some accessibility basics because we're focusing on something really technical, automated testing. But you should become familiar with accessibility basics. I have them listed in my slides, and there's a link to more principles if you want to read more. But some things you should be considering if you're a web developer are text alternatives, including alt text for images, form labels, um, off-screen text if you have graphical, like infographics and things like that, document structure and hierarchy, which we'll touch a little bit today in talking about headings, HTML semantics, uh, which you should definitely be using, use real buttons and so on. Keyboard interactivity, making sure that if you're creating custom controls that they are reachable and operable from the keyboard and they have adequate focus styles. Color contrast, that's a huge population of people as well as keyboard interactivity, um, not just blind people or you know, people with deafness or hard of hearing. Um, these visual disabilities are a, a little more subtle and they affect huge populations of people. So color contrast is in that category and visual contrast in general, which even my slides, uh, this projector looks a little different than my computer screen. So my slides need adequate contrast. And then lastly, if you're building single page apps or client rendered applications, you should be familiar with focus management. It means that you are guiding the user's keyboard focus around your app so that if you're opening dialogues or bottom sheets or other components, that they, their focus isn't being dropped that you're actually curating their focus experience so that you can notify them when things are opening and things are happening. Um, and I have some resources at the end if you want to learn more about that. But there was a time when I didn't know accessibility. Like, you have to start somewhere. And so it's important to recognize that you're not going to be perfect at this right away. Uh, Jake the dog from Adventure Time says, dude, sucking at something is the first step towards becoming sort of good at something. And that's OK. You know, it's, it's not a, something that's going to be perfect all the time. But every little bit of accessibility that you contribute is so appreciated and so needed that you can just learn more as you go 
and it, it's a huge win anytime there's something for accessibility that we're including. But we're developers. This is a JavaScript conference. So we are going to let the tooling that we are already familiar with using JavaScript task runners and tools that we love to work with because they're technical and geeky, we can use this tooling to do some heavy lifting for us, help us identify accessibility issues in our apps, the low-hanging fruit stuff that you don't need to pay someone to find. If you can automate that, you can free up people's time to test things that are a little bit more nuanced and more subjective. So we're going to talk about manual testing. Um, you know, where do I start when I audit a website for accessibility? Then we'll move into what I'm calling sort of automated testing. Not, ren not looking at the rendered uh, source code, but using some tools to help you identify issues. And then lastly, we'll talk about what you really came to hear about, which is definitely automated testing and how you can incorporate accessibility testing. So for example, if you could prevent a broken build from going out into the wild. Um, automating that so it can withhold a, a, a deployment of some kind. But the elephant in the room that I have to mention to you because we're talking about automated accessibility testing is that it is no substitute for real user feedback, including people with disabilities. You want to have people testing your apps so that they can tell you when something really sucks, like Peter Griffin saying what really grinds his gears, because that feedback is so valuable. So that should be part of your strategy as well. Um, and even you know, getting to accessibility earlier in the design process too. Um, those are all very important things, but we are here to talk about automated testing, which is an important thing to know how to do. So the first thing that I do when I look at a website to figure out what's the accessibility situation is I just tab through uh, the page with the keyboard. So we're gonna do that real quick. I'm gonna show you gov.uk, which has pretty good focus styles. Um, it has some solid blocks of color. The text links are either um, bolded with blue text or bold with white text. And if we start tabbing through the page, the focus indicator is really obvious. It's orange color on whatever the other background color is. And it actually really shows you effectively where you are on a web page. It has been pointed out to me that this is technically not WCAG AA compliant. Um, and that's because there isn't quite enough visual contrast to meet that standard. But what they could do to fix it is either um, widen the visual contrast between the foreground and background colors, or you could make the text bigger. So you have some things that you could do to, to fix this. Um, but compared to most websites, gov.uk is awesome. And it's winning the focus style. Um, like They do it the best out of any site I've seen. So they deserve a pat on the back. OK, so that's the first thing I do. The next thing I do, uh, which I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, but you should be demoing in screen readers. I'm going to show you SoundCloud in Safari with VoiceOver, which is the screen reader on the Mac. But it's not the most used screen reader. IE and JAWS on Windows is the most used. Um, NVDA, which is an open source screen reader, and Firefox are well used. There's also mobile screen readers. Um, iOS Safari with VoiceOver is great. Talkback with Firefox and Android is great. Um, but you should be checking your stuff in a screen reader so that you kind of know what's going on in your app. So we're going to demo. Oh, wrong window. OK, so I'm going to hit Command F5 and fire up VoiceOver. VoiceOver on Safari. Your stream on SoundCloud. Window. Your stream on SoundCloud. H. Visited. Link. SoundCloud. Banner so you seven see how items. the SoundCloud link? Muting. It is just a graphic. There's no text saying SoundCloud. But when I use the screen reader, SoundCloud has done a great job in adding text alternatives to their images. So when I tab through it with a screen reader, even though it's a graphic button, I get some text because it says SoundCloud on it. Visited, link, 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 upload, banner seven items. Marcy underline SSS is avatar Marcy underline SSS pop-up button. So this is a pop-up little toggle thing. If I hit enter. Tracks. Link. Group. It opens the, the pop-up and it sends my focus into it. Now I'm in this, this list of child You are links. currently on a list inside of H. Muting. Trick with voiceover. Mute it. Um, so we're in this little pop-up list. And to get out, it's really easy. I just hit escape. Marcy underline SSS is avatar Marcy underline SSS pop-up button. Banner seven items. Spake voiceover off. So that's just a really quick demo with voiceover um, to show you what it's like to use it. And it, 
again, you just turn it on with Command F5 on the Mac, and then you can go check it out. And I will say Safari works a little better than Chrome. Um, but it's a good thing to do every now and then. So that's one of the first things I do. Now I want to get into sort of automated testing, uh, using a few tools that I think are useful. Something that you should be checking for are headings and semantic structure. So the web was created for documents. We're creating applications. It doesn't mean that because you're creating an application, you get to throw out the uh, semantic structure and not care about it. Because a user with a screen reader can use the, uh, your heading structure to get an overall picture of what is on your site. Um, they can also navigate by headings and other landmarks. So this Firefox web developer toolbar, I love because it can show you uh, the heading structure. So if you install the toolbar, go to information and then view document outline, you can see the heading structure on your page. And I still use this. It's just, it's probably the only feature in this toolbar I still use. Um, but for my Tumblr accessibility wins, uh, when I was hacking at a Tumblr theme, I could go and see what the heading structure was, make adjustments, and then it will show you when everything is all aligned. So next I want to tell you about the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools, which you, it's a must-have for any web developer these days. Um, it's great for checking the overall page accessibility for any website, um, in, especially in active development. It catches kind of the low-hanging fruit um, of things that you like missing labels and things. So let's go check out um, an audit. OK, so I'm going to pick on CNN today. Let's go see what crusty uh, accessibility things they have going on. So I'm going to open up the dev tools. And I have the extension installed. So under audits, I get an accessibility audit, which I can go and run. And it will go and it will look at their site, analyze it, run tests against it, and it will report back to you what's wrong with it. So they are missing a bunch of form labels. Um, if I drill down into it, I can look at the specific node that is a problem. I can reveal it in the elements panel and go over here in the element inspector. You get a couple little add-ons. Um, actually, with the extension, you get this accessibility properties panel. And it will show you some of the accessibility information. Um, I'm using Chrome Canary, which actually has a DevTools experiment. Um, if you're curious, I, I can send you the information later um, because it's sort of hard to enable. But the deal is that this extension will be moved into the DevTools at some point, and there, Google is working on that right now. But if you have it enabled in Chrome Canary, you get this secret panel of extra information of the accessibility node. Um, and this will tell you what role it has, if it has any ARIA attributes, and so on. That highlights an important concept that I want you to know, which is about the accessibility tree. Uh, the accessibility tree is something created by browsers. It is a parallel structure to the DOM, and it has in it semantic information that screen readers and other assistive technologies can use to present information without performance implications of everything else that's in the DOM. So the accessibility tree, you can check a couple different ways. Um, if you go to chrome colon slash slash accessibility, you can look at a raw dump of the accessibility tree of every tab that you have open, which you can imagine it's turned off by default because uh, that would be pretty big performance hit. Um, I have a post in my slides from the past yellow group about more on the accessibility tree, including their Windows tool called AViewer, which is also really helpful for that. But when I first got into the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools, I found on GitHub that they have all of, the, all of the library code is out there under the Google Chrome organization on GitHub, and down to every audit rule as a, is a JavaScript file. And I didn't quite know what those were for. I felt like Finn from Adventure Time going, what do you do with those? Well, that's where we get into definitely automated testing. I'm going to start by showing you a tool by Adi Osmani, which is an NPM module called Ali. Ali is a numeronym for accessibility. So you take out all the letters in the middle, A and Y are at the end. If you see me tweeting that a lot, it's because it's shorter. Um, but Adi made a really awesome NPM module. And you can just install it uh, with NPM install Ali, and then you require it. Uh, you get access to this object that you can then call the same audit that we ran in the browser from the command line. So I'm going to show you this. Um, instead of put it, pulling it into a JavaScript file, we're just going to run it from the command line. So I'm going to type a11y space cnn.com. 
And then we're going to wait and hope that it resolves. Um, it takes a second. It's a little bit longer than the browser extension. Um, but this is actually using PhantomJS, which is a headless uh, browser. So we're not seeing the browser open. This is running on the command line using Phantom, going and hitting their site, and then returning an audit back to us. So hopefully this will work. Slow conference Wi-Fi. So the audit that it gave back to us is the same audit that we got in the browser extension, except this is a, on the command line. So I find that this report is a little bit harder to digest than the browser extension. Um, but you can see it tells you the same warnings. It says the controls and media elements should have labels. And then it points you to a node in the, the, uh, the DOM tree. It actually shows you the... Um, the tree of items, uh, selectors, that, that it actually used to point you to that node in the browser. Um, so this is pretty cool, but um, I'm not quite sure how I would use this in a project yet. I will add that there is a grunt um, task for Ally that could be useful. Ways that you could integrate uh, automated testing for accessibility. What if you ran it on every save so that you could check whether something was inaccessible? It might be a little aggressive, but you could also run it on every commit. Maybe you wanted to check that uh, you had a pre-commit hook for Git, and you could check whether something is broken. More likely, you're going to run it on a deployment. You're going to say, if you push out a build that's broken, I'm either not going to let it go forward, or I can use Travis on GitHub to say, hey, the build is broken, and that person broke it. Which leads us to Protractor, which is the end-to-end -end testing framework for Angular. Um, I'm focusing on this because I worked on it, but the concepts are similar for any framework. Um, Protractor is a node um, module that runs on top of Selenium WebDriver. And what that does is it fires up a browser programmatically, you tell it where to go, what views to open, and you basically set up your website so that then you can run tests against it and assert that it's doing the right thing at the right time. I wrote an accessibility plugin for Protractor um, that I'll tell you about a little bit. But Protractor would be really useful. It's, it's what's called end-to-end -end testing. It's useful for testing multiple components on a page together, um, as opposed to unit testing, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but some things that you could test for include focus management, like if you are writing a single page or client-rendered app. You could check for live updates, like say your focus is in an input field and at the act of typing filters something somewhere else on the screen. You want to make sure that those components are working together. That might be a good thing to test for with end-to-end um, -end testing. Or color contrast. Maybe you want to check the color contrast across your whole app. You could do that in this as well. So to get an example, we're going to look at Angular Material Start, which um, I mentioned I've worked on Angular Material, which is a component library built on material design, or built on Angular using material design. The Angular Material Start is just a, a small repository that you can grab on GitHub to get started. And so I wanted to incorporate the Protractor plugin into this. So I did it maybe two weeks ago. So the interface for this is pretty simple. It only really has one, one view. Um, it has a list of users on the left side nav, and when you click on one, it opens their uh, specific view in the primary column on the right. There's a little share button, and if you tap that, it will open a bottom sheet, which is kind of like a dialogue in that it opens on top of things, um, but it is a, a sort of drawer that comes up from the bottom. It's kind of a mobile pattern in material design. The idea with this, though, is that it is an interim element. And so when it opens for a keyboard user or a screen reader user, we want to send their focus there, both so that they are alerted to new content, but also so that their focus is in the general location of this new content. So this would be a perfect thing to write a test for. I want to assert that the first button in the bottom sheet has focus. So some setup that I had to do for Protractor. Um, the config file for Protractor, this is in the project now, but I had to add a line to enable the plugins, which come with Protractor now. Um, those come with the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools. You just have to enable them in your config. It also supports uh, the Tenon API, which is an accessibility API. It's super awesome, really robust. It requires a subscription um, and an API key, but that is worth considering as well. And then the other thing I had to do was add a Selenium address in the config file. Then in the package.json, there under the dev dependencies, there's a section called scripts. And in there, you can put any arbitrary 
hook that you want to run from the command line. So for me to run npm test, for example, I put a, a path to the binary for Protractor, it, which is the node module that we download with npm install, and then the location of the config that we just looked at. So once we have this set up, we can write some tests. And so the tests that are in the project, I think they look a little different now, but the tests for the bottom sheet, um, it assumes that you have already navigated to the page and that you have already clicked on one of the avatars on the left. But the, this is a Jasmine test, so it starts with a describe statement, um, just an arbitrary what we're testing. And then in the before each, we have to click on that little share button to get the bottom sheet to open. So we're setting up Selenium WebDriver to be in the state that we want to test. So once that happens, we can test, we can assert that it should focus on the first item. And this, there's you know, an infinite number of ways that you could write a test. Um, this was the first pass I took at this. And what I did was I iterated through the buttons in the bottom sheet, and when it focuses on one, we have a hold of the active element. And so I just verify that the one we're iterating over is the same one as the active element. You could do this other ways too, but that was how I verified that the focus management piece was working. So on top of that, that's a test that I wrote, and that is the secret to this plugin, is that you have to write tests that hit different parts of your app, and then the plugin currently it doesn't crawl your whole app. You have to uh, write some tests, and then if you have the plugin enabled, like I showed you in the config, it will actually run the same audit tools that we, or the audits that we run in, ran in the browser extension and Addy's tool, same uh, library. It will run those against your markup in Protractor, which is really cool. Um, and Material Start actually, everything passed, so I had to make it fail just to show you what a failure looked like. Um, ironically, the pass and fail messages on the command line are in red and green, which I have heard are a little hard to see for some people. Um, so that's a change that we need to make. But it does also say pass and fail in text, so it's not relying on color alone. Um, but that's an improvement that I would like to make, um, which I can imagine, I mean, even on a different monitor could be harder to see. And then quickly I'll mention again that Tenon API um, is another option. And if you're interested in that, you can go and look at the Protractor documentation. But to fix those failures that I made fail on purpose, um, the, the view for the bottom sheet um, it has a list of contacts that it iterates over an object, um, and for each item, there's a button with an icon in it. I just removed the text from the icon so that it would fail. And then to fix it, I just add the text back in, which you can see highlighted. And then we are going to run it on the command line and see if it works. So um, I have a command line in my slides, and I'm just typing npm test. So that's the hook that we put into package.json. So I have Selenium WebDriver running in another tab in my terminal. Uh, we can see Selenium open up the browser. And now I have to go back to the slide. So the difference between Addy's tool and this one was Addy's used uh, Phantom. So it didn't open another browser. It didn't move our focus away. Um, with Protractor, it's actually using WebDriver to fire up a browser. We specified Chrome in the config, but you could fire up Firefox. Um, you could run it in other environments. But what that's doing is actually running our tests against that real browser. And then since I fixed uh, the, the code in the HTML, now it passes all of the, um, the, the failures that we had before. We can also see that there are, in the actual material start, there are two tests. I only showed you one of them, um, but that, the actual real project, which I'm running on my computer, that has two tests. Um, and then we have the plugin enabled, so on top of our tests, it runs the Chrome Accessibility Audit. It's pretty awesome. I'm pretty stoked about that. So uh, in comparison, unit testing. And actually, this is something I use more in my day-to-day -day work as a developer. Uh, unit testing um, is different, in, different from end, end testing in that you need to write tests for individual components. Things you could test are ARIA properties that need to change with user interaction, uh, keyboard operability to make sure that tab index is enabled and uh, keyboard commands work, text alternatives, making sure, for example, if you had an icon button and you wanted to make sure that it had a label enforced or it fell back to a label or something, um, and semantics as well. So unit testing is a really great way. Like If you're not already doing unit testing, you should be. <laughs> That's what I went to learn at my last job. But Accessibility fits in with that so well because you all of a sudden have test coverage 
across your whole app for accessibility. So an example that I use a lot um, is that I am the primary contributor to NG Aria, the accessibility module for Angular. And there's some things that I like about it, some things I want to change, um, but I have an example of a custom checkbox, and it's a custom element with web components and uh, just custom HTML now. You can write any tag name that you want. So I have some dash checkbox. And then using ng model and ng checked in Angular, I can have it dynamically add attributes. So what ng aria is doing is ensuring that the aria checked attribute is on the element as well as the checked attribute. So if I uncheck the checkbox, we see aria checked change to false. And we see the HTML5 checked attribute go away because it, and that actually, checked is what it, ng checked is adding, but because this isn't a real checkbox, it's not an input, we need ARIA to actually tell the accessibility tree in a screen reader that it's checked or unchecked. Um, but the one thing that we want to look at here is that this has tab index. So ng model, when it detects a role of checkbox, or there's certain scenarios um, where it will add tab index dynamically. And that is what I want to show you the test for. I'm actually refactoring ng aria right now because it's a bit too liberal with the attributes that it adds. So I have some tests in my refactored version that I'm working on locally um, about which elements it should attach to. And because Angular has thousands of unit tests, I usually use, um, I will isolate to the ng aria tests. So I validate that it should not attach to native controls meaning buttons, if, they, if you put ng click on a button, it doesn't need tab index. It should attach to custom inputs, and it should attach to elements with ng click, uh, like divs. So this is the kind of stuff that ng aria, the opportunity that we have to actually improve Angular applications and accessibility, um, but we need a little bit of finessing to get this module in a better place. So unit testing is obviously a huge part of that. And actually, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that since we have some more time than I thought we would. Um, the unit testing, um, every time I go to add a feature to something like NG Aria or Angular Material, I will start with the test. Test-driven development, we're probably all familiar with it. But for accessibility, you can even do that. So when I went to make these changes to NG Aria, I would actually start with the test. And it would fail because NG Aria is doing things that it shouldn't right now. It adds tab index to a native button. So I start by writing the test. And then I go back to the code, and then I make the changes to get all the tests to pass. Um, there's actually a lot of features in NG Aria, so it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. Um, but that should be coming up pretty soon. So today we've talked about keyboard and screen reader testing as a manual way to actually check or diagnose the accessibility of an app. We looked at sort of automated tools like the Firefox Web Developer Toolbar and the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools. Uh, which the latter, the Chrome tool, I would highly recommend using. Firefox, uh, the web developer toolbar is cool. It's a little bit more dated, and I'd say the, um, the heading feature is the only one that I really use. But then in automated testing, we talked about Addy's Alley module and Protractor. Um, there's other tools out there like Quail uh, and Tenon and all these really cool things that you could use to automate accessibility testing. And there's more of a culture, like I'm up here talking to you about it at JSConf. I never thought that this would be a subject that people would want to hear about. Um, but it's starting to change and there are more tools and more resources for, for us as developers to actually make the world better, make a more accessible web. Um, so it's really exciting to see these things start to happen. In case you're like, whoa, OK, I know about automated stuff, but I don't know anything about accessibility, I have a ton of resources in my slides, including, uh, including people with disabilities and user research, because that's something we should be doing. Conducting user evaluations. Um, as developers, I always think it's really cool when I get to go do a different task than development, like interviewing users. I think that's really valuable. I have a couple blog posts uh, about auditing a website for accessibility, a recent one from Smashing Magazine on notes on client rendered accessibility. Um, there's some more tooling on a W3C post about web accessibility evaluation tools. Uh, the WebAIM screen reader survey is the closest thing we have to analytics for accessibility. You can go and check what do people self-report, what are they telling us that they use uh, for browsers and screen readers. And we can basically look at that and then look at our own analytics to tell, you know, do I really need to support IE8? You could go and check. Um, and then a little bit on what is ARIA, because I didn't go into that very much. 
So that means that we're at the end. And there may be something awesome happening now. Beyonce dancing with like a pizza coming out, I think is a, a win alone. Um, we're actually done a little bit early. So I wanted to say, in case you don't get a slice of pizza, I have some pizza buttons that I would be happy to give to you. Um, and you can come and find me at any time and uh, ask me questions about accessibility. Um, I'm pretty passionate about it, obviously. Um, our magic thing is not, not happening. Oh. That sucks. <laughs> you know, I had a really good run. Last year was amazing, and uh, I guess it's just not happening. What was supposed to happen was that there was supposed to be a pizza that came out. I actually really want pizza. I skipped the afternoon snack. So it just, my dreams are foiled. Your pizza dreams. As a, uh, as a consolation prize, I have an inflatable pizza slice that we can play with in the pool. I don't know if you heard about that. I'm really glad I brought that now because I'm so let down that the pizza didn't show up. Give them an angry phone call. Anyway, thanks for uh, letting me dawdle here for a minute, but um, it's been really fun talking to you, so thanks. Yeah.